Hi guys, it's an honor to be here speaking at Steam Dev Days 2016. It's great to be around so many developers, thousands of developers from all over the world working on game content, video content, we've got people working on innovative software, virtual reality experiences, all types of things, all under one roof. When I was asked to put together a talk for Steam Dev Days, it was suggested that I would work on a talk about advice for Steam developers to help find success. One of the things that, uh, as I was preparing for this talk a few months ago that was pretty apparent quickly was that I probably wasn't the right person to actually give this advice. And, uh, and so I had to think hard. I was like, well, what's the best advice I can give developers uh, that they could take away and hopefully uh, have uh, some action with? So what I did is I decided to reach out to a bunch of successful Steam developers and actually ask them themselves, hey, give me advice that I can give to other developers at the event. And, uh, and so I reached out to 17 successful uh, PC game developers. And I asked them two questions. I asked them, if you could share one very important tip for an up-and-coming PC game developer, what would it be? And then I also asked them, if you could make one change to the way that you launched your game, knowing what you know now, what would you change? Well, the feedback came pouring in to my inbox, and it was pretty apparent quickly that uh, that these developers were passionate about what they do, and that they also really wanted to give you guys tips and advice uh, to help you all uh, find success as well. Some of them sent back uh, one piece of advice, and then they just, it just went on and on and on and on and on and on. They like paragraphs and paragraphs about this same point. Uh, others would give me five or six different tips. And so then I had the job of like putting all of this together like a puzzle. I'm like, well, how does all this work in this big spreadsheet of everybody's advice? And uh, it actually was interesting that it all came down to seven points. They, they all sort of agreed on seven things. So I'm going to pull out a selection of quotes from these developers. Uh, it's definitely not exhaustive, but I'm, I'm going to try to uh, represent them well as best as I can. But before we go any further, I think it's really important um, that I say one thing. Don't assume anyone knows what they're talking about, and this includes me. And when I say this, I mean that your game's unique, your community's unique, uh, and you know ultimately what's best for your game. There's no sort of one-size-fits-all solution or some piece of advice that I'm going to give you today that is going to all of a sudden make your game explode. Uh, but I do suggest that you listen, you think critically, and then you decide if some of these tips work for your game or, or your uh, experience that you're creating. And at the end of the day, you should do what's best for your community and, and what's best for, for your company. So the first piece of advice that came out of this uh, group of developers that I spoke to was to be honest with your work. People described this in many different ways, but it was actually one of the most, uh, the biggest um, uh, pieces of advice from the, the, the collective group. And some people described, uh, they described game design like art. Uh, other people, when describing being honest with your work, they talked about you know, being your own worst critic and really making sure that you, know, you believe that your game is, uh, is ready, is ready for people to invest time and money in. One of the uh, people who was most vocal about this was uh, Edmund McMillan. He, uh, he said, game design is a conversation with players about things you find interesting. So he talks a bit about, hey, this is a, it's a conversation and, uh, and you actually get to, to talk to people um, through the game that you design. The other thing that he, uh, that he also said was, passionate developers make long-lasting impact on their community. When he talked about this point, uh, he kind of said, hey, you know, my goal is actually to make the biggest impact on the community that I can. When I design a game, I want it to have a long-lasting impact that goes on and on. And, and it actually does translate to uh, excitement uh, about the games. He also, uh, when he talked about this, he was the one who, who talked about game design as art. He said, when you're passionate about a game and you really love what you're building and what you're creating, that it, that it will actually drive the game uh, away from, more away from being a business, more into to art. And, uh, and honesty can be seen through art. He also said, Pick apart the shortcomings of your work, what needs to be worked on, and where you need to grow. 
basically, be your own worst critic. Make sure that you know, you're, actually, uh, you're actually thinking critically about your game and the state that it's in and, and if it's ready. Um, PC gamers are smart. They're going to know whether you're invested in your game or not. Uh, and it may not translate to massive sales, but it will leave the biggest impact if you're honest uh, in your game design. Gary Newman said, make the game for yourself. The biggest mistake I see is people make is to target an audience that are not part of and don't understand just because that's where all the popularity is right now. He's got a strong point. He says, don't make the game just because that's where everybody's at. Uh, don't follow fads necessarily. Uh, make the game you really want. Uh, when I asked him, uh, you know, if, if there was any, uh, the second question about, you know, is there anything that you regret or, or anything you learned uh, that went bad with your game, uh, he said, no regrets. Sounds very much like Gary. Uh, so, things like asking yourself, like, what game do we want to make next? Uh, we get asked the Steam, as the Steam team all the time, we'll be asked things like, well, if I make a horror game uh, that's 1995, uh, can I expect to make, sell 30,000 units? Or they'll ask something like, well, what, what genre of game should we make next? What's, what's the most popular uh, genre on Steam right now? We don't ever answer those questions. Those are actually uh, sort of impossible questions to answer. They're also really dangerous to answer uh, because the fact of the matter is, is uh, there isn't any right answer. Uh, if you're making a game you love, then the upside is huge. Uh, if you're just into making a game because it's the hot genre right now, well, it, it, it's, it's going to come across in your game. Jeremy, uh, who's actually speaking next uh, from the ARC team, he said, as a small developer, you can't afford to be the best at everything. Figure out what you do better than anyone else and hone in on that. So he's saying, figure out what works best for you and your team. Figure out where your strengths are and, 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 and go there. When I talked to Jesse, who also uh, works on ARC, he said, uh, when the team got together at the beginning and they were deciding what game they wanted to make, they had to kind of get together, do a bit of soul searching, and, and they realized pretty quickly, he said, that you know, making a single-player, story-driven game just it was not their forte. It was not the thing that they thought that their team uh, could actually do successfully. They were being honest uh, before they even built their game with their, about their team. It, but they did know they were all really into survival games. They thought, hey, you know, we think we could actually make a really great survival game, maybe even better than anyone else. And, but now the question is, well, what, what kind of survival game do we want to make? And so they were sort of digging into what are the sort of experiences and things that had inspired them. And then things came up in their talk uh, together about 80s shows like Dino Riders being an uh, inspiration to them and 90s games like Turk Dinosaur Hunter, which uh, actually happens to be on Steam now, just got re-released. And 90s books like Dinotopia came up. So they had this common thing where they were talking about, oh, we're, we are really into dinosaurs. This group actually has a bunch of experiences of, uh, of dinosaurs when we want to make a survival game. All right, now it's clear. Let's go ahead and make this dinosaur survival game. And, uh, and I think uh, their passion for it comes across in, in their game design. Another great example, I think, of someone who really loves what they do and loves the, uh, the game they've made is, uh, is Stardew Valley. Uh, this is a really fun story. Um, I got to talk to Eric Barone a bit about his game. Uh, he's a local guy. Uh, he's actually here at uh, Dev Day somewhere, probably looking at him. Uh, and he, uh, he said he went to the U University of Washington in Tacoma, and he got a computer science degree. And when he got done with college, he was uh, trying to get a, uh, a job in the game industry. And he thought, you know, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump right in. Well, it wasn't that easy. Getting a job was actually much tougher than he had expected. And, uh, and so he decided, all right, I'm going to get a job. He actually got a job just down the street at the Paramount Theater, about two blocks from here, as an usher, just to pay the bills. And then in the evenings and weekends, he decided, I'm going to work on building a game, I guess. And he said it was really just a design, a design exercise for him. I'm just going to keep up my coding skills, kind of work on a game. And then while he was thinking about it, he said, well, uh, what, what games have, have inspired me? What are games that, uh, that I've loved um, as a starting point? And the game Harvest Moon came up. And he thought, oh, well, yeah, I think I'll, I really love Harvest Moon. I'll make a game kind of like that. And it just started out as sort of a fun passion project. 
Well, this solo passion project went on for four years, and he continued to build and build and build. And this game became much bigger than I think his, uh, his initial scope for the project. And, uh, and now it, it comes through. You, even, the, even the press reviews about the game will say, you know, that it's a, a passion project, or they can really see his love for the genre. Those sorts of things come through, even in, in the, the press when they, uh, when they talk about it. Uh, the result is he sold over a million copies of the game. Uh, and it has overwhelmingly positive reviews. His piece of advice for you all was, believe in yourself and have complete faith in your game. Don't let negative thoughts get in the way of achieving that. It can be a fight, especially as a solo developer. The next point that came out from all the developers' advice was to pay attention to your release timing. This is kind of a, it's actually kind of a simple, um, simple point. Um, but you'd be surprised how many people will uh, come to us and, and uh, tell us, oh, we were planning on launching our game right in the middle of the winter sale. And it's like, oh, well, you know, we eclipsed the store page. It's probably not the best time to launch your game. So uh, you know, planning uh, for when you're going to launch your game, is, it's really important. Some of the things that were said, Martin, who worked on Vermintide, he said, you're not only competing for people's money, but you're also competing for their time. I think it's interesting here. He's, he's, he's actually figured out that, yeah, it's, it's not just money, it's time. And, and honestly, if you think about it that way, well, then you're going to think about, well, what are the big games? What are the big things that are launching over the next six months? And what's going to be competing for people's times? There's big, big games that come out every year that, that sort of just take over. Tons of people are playing these games, and it's the place that everybody's at, and, and you know, launching right on top of that game might not make sense. Um, Tom, who works at Dedalic, he said, use the Steam Coming Soon list and other sites to see what, what is planning to launch around your game. It's a simple, uh, simple piece of advice, but uh, we do actually have mo more and more developers are using the coming soon list, and you can actually look out three to six months and see, hey, what games are planning to launch? What's coming up? And also, other sites will show you sort of what are these sort of large games that have retail presence and such that um, are planning to come out as well over the year. And you can you can kind of quickly map together sort of a, a, a calendar of, of launches. Um, it's also it's good to talk about. Uh, the fact that you can actually plan to launch your game on sort of a non-standard day, like a day that is not sort of typically a retail launch or a launch for really big titles uh, that you know are coming out. They seem to follow a pattern, and it's pretty easy to pick up on it. The other thing that he said that I thought was interesting, he said, a pre-purchase may dilute your week one impact. This is why we're not offering pre-order campaigns in our games. So this is interesting coming from Dedalic because they actually used to do very complex pre-order offers. They used to have uh, ones that would come with all types of merchandise, and their, uh, their pre-order offers um, would be a, for a very long amount of time. And they've actually learned that over the years, as they're seeing more and more sales digitally, that actually, uh, when I talked to him, he's like, we're splitting up our, our, not only our marketing about the game when it's coming to launch, but we're also splitting up um, our customers, and we're splitting them up over a, over a time, and we really want to get them when they're, you know, we want to have maximum impact around launch. It's important to capture attention to people of people when they're likely to buy. One of the trends we've seen is that even really huge games, games that have, you know, marketing budgets bigger than, you know, most huge movies, uh, these games will be promoting their game for six months, eight months, sometimes a year. They'll put on pre-orders that last for six months. But when you actually look at the sales data for um, digital sales of those games, it really comes down to the last two or three weeks. That's when customers are actually willing to purchase those games. Uh, it really doesn't matter you know, what you do in the front end of it. People are really purchasing closer to launch. Uh, and so I understand where Tom's going. He's like, hey, you know what? Let's just take our pre-order offer and just shift it into our week one and just focus on engaging uh, customers at the right time when they're m most likely to, to, to buy the game and invest time. Tyrone, is, he was a little more uh, prescriptive in his, uh, in his suggestion. He said, we avoid launching a game near large physical events like GDC, PAX, and, or E3. And we also now schedule releases a minimum of four weeks between large seasonal sales. With the former, you're fighting for coverage and news, which is plus minus two weeks in, in each direction. And with sales, you're forcing customers to choose between your game at full price or other discounted games they put on their wish list. 
I wouldn't uh, suggest you take his advice for you know, being literal and you need to do exactly the same thing and that this two-week thing is exactly it. But I think his point really here is, is you know, look at what big events are coming uh, think about when the press is going to be tied up with something else and, and maybe, uh, maybe avoid those, uh, those times. The next point that the, uh, the developers had were, was to be part of your community. They talk about this in many ways, but uh, I think the real point here was, you know, meet them where they're at. Be in the community, be listening to your community. And, uh, and there's many different ways to do this. I'm going to show a few different examples. Brian Fargo, who worked on Wasteland, he said, earn trust from your community, be invested in supporting your game long term. Brian connects that trust can be gained by updating your game, by supporting the game, by showing your community that you're invested in it and that you want to make it better over time. Sometimes the most efficient uh, form of communication with your community is simply doing a big update. Also, you may consider running a sale during a big update to attract new customers to your game if it's the right time for your game, uh, because likely you'll have the most amount of uh, players coming back to the game at that time, and it's a great time to, to bring in new customers as well. A community can be a really great guide for maybe what new features may go into the game or, or adjustments you might make. Adrian from Kerbal Space Program, he says, the community is your most valuable guide, however the final word is yours. You'll never be able to please everyone, so don't kill yourself trying. I think we've all been there when you think, hey, the community is upset. I don't know exactly what to do. Um, his point is here, hey, don't, don't kill yourself. You can't, you can't make them all happy. But, uh, it's, it's, but it is your most valuable guide. He points that out. So listening to the community is important. There's a wealth of knowledge in the community, and, and they want to tell you about, uh, about your game and how it's going. Robin Walker uh, from Valve, he did a, a, a talk, Community and Communication and Games as a Service. If you haven't seen this video, I suggest you go and, and check it out. It's on the Steam uh, Dev Days uh, YouTube. Uh, and he had a bunch of points in there about how uh, Valve talks to our community. And he said uh, one of his points was, the best feedback we get from our customers is from, from the things they say to each other when they think we're not there. So actually, he talks a little bit about you know, it can be actually damaging to go into a, a healthy debate around game balance or about new features that are coming and come in and say, hey, we as game developer pick this side or we say we're, we, you should do this because it sort of disrupts the balance and you don't get uh, great, great data. Meredith, who uh, works on Warframe, she said, build a community that makes sense for your game. Your fans are your biggest champions and good word of mouth is probably the most valuable thing you can have. The stronger your community, the more they will fight for your game and defend it. How do you build that kind of community? Be as transparent as you can be to build a genuine relationship between you and the player base. And also be in as many places as you can afford to be online, social media, Reddit, official forums, live streaming, in-person events. I think her point is meet them where they're at. If they're on Reddit, be there listening. If they're in the Steam Community Hub, be there. Be listening, be part of that community. See what's going on. Find out where they group up and listen. What this doesn't mean is have a community manager and it's their job to talk to the community. And it's their job if the community's upset to fix it. Um, community should, talking to the community should be a group, uh, a group thing. Should be encouraged that you know, developers and artists and everyone is able to and feels empowered to go and listen to the community and what they're talking about and what they think about the game. It's good to have skilled communicators, people who are great writers who can, can help you uh, craft a great message, but at the end of the day, it should be a group that's all, uh, all part of this community. Nelson, who works on Unturned, he said, update your game often and it will show the community that you're listening. Nelson's got an interesting story. He works on a, a free-to-play um, called Unturned on Steam. And uh, he, as a 15-year-old, uh, uh, started working on this game. It was a Roblox game. And, uh, and eventually, he brought it to Greenlight. He said when he, uh, it was when he was in high school. So he was coming home from high school each day looking at Greenlight to see if he had been greenlit yet. Eventually, uh, he was greenlit actually pretty quick. And uh, now it's a, a very successful free-to-play on Steam. It's actually our uh, fourth most uh, played free-to-play. He's a one-man team. 
um, but he's actually found a way to be in his community and be part of his community. And it, it actually shows, if you go back a little bit in time and you look at some of his posts from 2014, at the bottom of this sort of uh, update post that could be very dry, it could just be patch notes and update and that's it, but really he shows right at the bottom, he says, today's community feature, and he puts in a YouTube video of, of his community uh, messing around showing flying cars in the game. He also, if you note up a little higher than that, he says, no update tomorrow, however, I'm turning 17. Thought that was pretty cool. And then later he added workshop to the game, so embracing his community even more, saying, hey, actually, you guys are great at making content, why don't you make content for the game? And, uh, and now there's, you know, 25 different vehicles on the workshop that can come in the game. You can, you know, UFOs can come into the game now. Uh, and then he said that uh, most recently, he actually reached out to some of the top workshop uh, contributors and he said, hey, do you guys want to work on something together? Would you guys like to work on, uh, how about a map? We all work on a map together. And they were like, yeah, let's do it. So as a team, now he has a team. One man, one man developer has a team of developers that want to work with him and they uh, made the biggest uh, expansion to the game, the Russia map that came out recently. Uh, it's a pretty cool story. He also follows his, uh, his community. So there's these YouTubers that are actually doing this sort of reality show uh, with the game called Gang Z. And so they're all together like playing different characters. It's very like surreal. It's like a, you're watching a movie within the game. It's, it's, it's very fun. And uh, he says he follows them. He also adds features to the game to help support them in creating their, uh, in creating their um, sort of reality show. And then most recently in the NPC update in the Russia map, he actually added one of the characters that was just from this YouTube series. He brought P. Rizzo into the game, who's the super salesman. And now he's in the game as an NPC, so it's, it's sort of this figurative, fun thing in the community is becoming a reality uh, within the game. The next, uh, the next point that the developers uh, gave me to give to you was to try not to be slave to a timeline. And this isn't uh, don't have a plan or don't have a timeline or uh, you know those sorts of things. I think their points were more around quality, that quality should be more important than the timeline itself. Steve, who worked on Chivalry, said, never launch a game that is good enough. He also talks about quality and polish pay back exponentially. There's kind of this conflict he's talking about, which is this timeline and quality, and sometimes they like clash, and you have to decide, all right, is the timeline more important or is the quality more important for our game? His point here is quality, polish, it's the most important thing. Game design is an endurance race, and you need to push product quality as far as you can before launch. PC customers are smart. Selling a game that's half-baked just as a way to raise money, it's just not a good plan. People will see through it. They'll know that, that the game's not ready. Uh, you'll get the feedback quickly. Here's a few practical ways to, to test your game uh, and to sort of hopefully uh, to help you give you a barometer of if your game you think it's ready and if it fits to the timeline that you planned. You should need to take the time to play test your game and your marketing. Get the game in front of people who, who will give you honest feedback. People that will give you that feedback that you know, is constructive and, and that criticism that you need to hear. Also, there's lots of ways to test your marketing. Uh, even putting up a coming soon page, you can go and look and see like, hey, how are my wish list ads? And when we changed our capsule art, we changed our description, did we see that our wish list ads changed? Was there some meaningful data that we could gather uh, from that? And things like playtesting your trailer to a wide variety of people, asking them, hey, what did, you know, what did you learn in the first 30 seconds? Tom talked a little bit about this. What, you know, uh, do you want to play the game now that you've seen this? You can also use early access keys, the uh, release override keys, the ones that are yellow in Steam stats, and, and get the game in front of a few hundred different people trying the game out and see, uh, see what they think. Uh, there's actually, I ran into some people here that said that was their actual goal of being here at Steam Developer Days was, hey, we want to meet a few hundred different developers and our goal is to get an email list going for feedback and get them early access keys so they can try out our upcoming game. Sven, who worked on Divinity Original Sin, he said, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression about the entertainment value of your game. So you have to get it right immediately, even in early access. While people understand there are things like bugs in an early version of the game, they want to have fun. So if your game isn't providing it, don't launch. 
even in early access, continue to iterate. He says, I realize financing is rough, especially if you're just starting, but you're not going to get anywhere near break even if you launch a game that's not fundamentally fun. I think he's, uh, he, he is pointing to the fact that, hey, fundamentally fun is the most important thing. Don't be slave to the timeline. The other point that came from the developers was to build the game that you can afford. So this is, people talk about it a bunch of different ways, but uh, really at the end of the day, it's, you know, what is the sort of core game that we want to create? And, uh, and what are the features that we believe we need to be able to accomplish that goal and, and sort of translate our, uh, our design to the, to the user? Mance from uh, Mojang, he said, limit the initial scope, plan for a small game, and then add padding. So he's saying, hey, you know what, we, we, we try to make our game small, and then, you know, of course, things are going to take more time. Um, it's a common topic when we talk to game developers that they're planning. You can tell pretty quickly talking to them that sometimes their scale is just too big. They've got this plan for their game that is so massive. And, uh, and then when sitting down and talking to them, we, we go through it and say, well, are you... You know, do you really need multiplayer, for example, or do you need you know all these, these all of these different features to make your game fun at launch? Uh, because those those features really do have a true cost. What features are essential to make your game fun? Henrik from Mojang he said, adding an additional feature is like adding 10 meters to a marathon. I thought this one was interesting. He talked about game design being like a marathon and it being this big, you know, like uh, Steve said, an endurance race. They're, you know, it's this long journey, it's super hard pushing towards, crunching towards launch. Uh, and as you decide, hey, I want to add a bunch of features, it, it is, it's like telling the marathon runner who's like in the middle of the run and exhausted, barely able to make it to the finish, uh, hey, we're going to add 10 more meters, oh, and then 10 more meters, and 10 more meters, and oh, yeah, that's going to add 10 more meters. At a certain point, uh, you have to think about that cost and decide if it's right. Sven said, focus on your target platform and language. Limit your scope will help you focus on making the game fun. What I'm not saying here is be exclusive or like Steam is the platform that you should necessarily target. It could be that your game actually is more suited to, to console. But depending on your team and their size, uh, you have to decide like what is our target platform? What is our target um, language? And how big are we? And, and what sort of resources do we have? What's realistic that we think we can get done for launch? Uh, he also said, like, you know, hey, if, if you don't go s crazy and put in all of these languages and, and platforms um, and the game doesn't become super successful, well, then you won't have that extra burden uh, before launch. It is, uh, it is interesting uh, in that, you know, localization is really important. So what I'm not saying is, hey, don't localize your game or only focus on English. Um, but I am saying, hey, focus on what you think is right for your game and what you think is the must-have. Uh, some interesting data on localization. Um, if you, we just looked at the uh, Steam user base and we saw that over half of the Steam users don't have English as their primary language in the uh, in their Steam in Steam. So what it tells you is, hey, actually, there's 58% of people who don't who don't necessarily speak English who are on Steam. So targeting them is is it's great to actually uh, to widen your um, your reach. The other thing we saw is in Japan. The top 10 games in Japan all had Japanese localization, and the top 200 games in Japan, uh, six, about 59% of them uh, had Japanese localization. So localization is important to um, widening your net to more um, users and, uh, and getting your experience in front of the most amount of people that you can. But it may not be the, the thing that you can actually take on um, for launch. So I want to show you an example of the long dark and sort of how they, uh, how they approached uh, localization. They launched their game in English only, uh, and then Raphael uh, from Hinterland, he said, well, then we looked into the data. We looked at Steam stats, and we said, well, uh, where, where are the people that are buying our game right now? Let's just use that as a barometer of what languages we should add. They saw pretty quickly uh, that 11% of the sales were coming uh, from Russia, 
and 6% were coming in from Germany. So they said, okay, these are, these are the first two languages we're going to focus on localizing. And it paid off. Now uh, Russian players make up 21% of playtime, and uh, German uh, users make up 8.5% of playtime. So it's actually grown uh, since they added um, localization. But they knew that their small team couldn't take on uh, localizing in all the different languages that they had hoped to. So what they did is they actually used Workshop for localization. They, uh, they put their official English translation up on Workshop, and then what he said is we just waited and, and saw how the community started localizing the game. Uh, and that, that was one point of interest. Um, we also could see uh, data on how many people were subscribing to all of the different languages. And, uh, and then in the end, then they would go and take the top ones and actually invest in sort of uh, making it a final polished um, uh, localization. So now they have uh, 12 languages that they've localized the game in officially, and there's another 18 languages that the community um, is supporting in Workshop now. So the game has a total of 30 languages, and it's not quite out of early access yet. It gets the game, truly gets the game in front of as many people as possible, but it's also um, building the game that the Hinterland team can afford. Another example of this is Action Hank. Rage Squid, uh, they started in early access, and uh, I remember uh, meeting the team in 2014 at PAX with my son, and we played the game, and it was, it was very fun. We had a blast. And uh, they, what they did is they just figured out, well, what are these essential features in the game that we need to have that will make the, the game really fun? And, and then let's grow from there over time. Uh, they definitely couldn't afford to have all the features that I think they eventually wanted um, baked and ready to go uh, back then. So in 2014, the game looked like this. It had single player, it had Steam leaderboards, um, being sort of a speed-based challenge, uh, leaderboards made sense for the game, and then full controller support because it's a really fun game to play in your living room, and uh, playing with a controller is a great way to play. Well then, uh, they added all of these things in blue by 2016. Now they're on eight different uh, platforms. Um, they've added feature after feature based on community feedback. And, uh, and now they even have a level editor uh, in the game. So they, they too found a way to build their game, the game they could afford, and over time it's, it's added features and, uh, and platforms. The other, uh, the other piece of advice that uh, the developers gave me to give to you was uh, to make your game obviously fun. There's a bunch of ways that they explain this, some of which are figuring out how to describe your game um, and things like that. Steve said, drill down into the core of why you're making the game you're making. So figure out, like, why did we start making this game? Why, what do we want to make? Figure out, can I communicate it effectively? Can we communicate the game we're trying to make to others, and can they get it? What makes your game unique? Figuring out what are those things about the game that, uh, that you... Uh, that you can drill down into and say, okay, this is the thing that, you know, this is why our game is different. He also said, focus on the core unique aspects of your game and promote them. And then he said, describe your game in one short phrase. This can be really, really helpful when you're building a game. If you can figure out, all right, what is the phrase that I can, that describes our game. It can help you with designing features. It can help you figure out what is the scope of the game. What's the thing, what are the items, the features that we need uh, to make this game fun? Um, I picked a few examples of uh, some single phrases that I think are, uh, are pretty good. Cluster Truck says, jump your way through insane levels in a game of the floor is lava on top of speeding trucks driven by terrible drivers. And even like even their capsule art there, you can see it's like you know it's mayhem, it's crazy. There's fire everywhere. There's lava flowing through the valley there. Um, I think floor is lava is actually a really easy to visualize. It's like okay, floor is lava. I got to stay off of it. How am I gonna you know you already kind of get the idea, the game mechanic. And then the out of control trucks. It's kind of like okay, well this is gonna be this is gonna be insane, and it, and it works. It really uh, describes it well. Subnautica says, descend into the depths of an alien underwater world filled with wonder and peril. Craft equipment, pilot submarines, outsmart wildlife to explore lush coral reefs, volcanoes, cave systems, and more, all while trying to survive. 
it's definitely a, a description of the game. When I got into the game, I, I got exactly what I was expecting. Within about 10 minutes, I knew, okay, this is, this is exactly the way that I was uh, expecting this game to happen. I, 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 I hear aliens underwater. I think depth and crafting, submarines, survival, all, uh, all very helpful in uh, describing the game to others. And Gang Beasts, they said... Gang Beast is a silly local multiplayer party game with surly, gelatinous characters, brutal melee fight sequences, sequences and absurdly hazardous environments. In this game, you know, this description I get, oh, this is a party game with friends, it's going to be brutal, it's going to be hilarious, and their art does a great job of uh, capturing that as well. But just by describing this, this can actually, early on, you can actually figure out, okay, well, what, what, what are, how are we going to build this game so that it reflects exactly what we're talking about. The last point that these uh, developers gave me was the whole equals the sum of its parts. They talk about this, uh, and the interesting thing here is this, this also comes from solo developers as well, so you'd think, well, how, how does that work? How does a group uh, work in that environment? Tyrone said, treat every part of your business as the most important part of the process. Programming, design, audio, marketing, customer support. He's kind of saying, hey, you need a diverse, strong group of people um, that can all work um, towards a common goal, and no part should be ignored. Uh, it's kind of this whole, like, let's have balance um, within our team, and let's, let's actually you know, pretend that the marketing is the most important thing. Let's also pretend that, uh, you know, that um, the programming is most important. And if you do that, then you, then you won't leave something behind. Brian Fargo said, solicit feedback internally. No one person can consider everything. And he's talking a lot about group thinking and co groups thinking, considering how they communicate to the community, things like that. Um, it's kind of taking a humble approach uh, to communication and also to game design and, uh, and saying, hey, we're better as a group. Developers uh, should be part of the communication to customers. Um, that's one of those things where, hey, we're group thinking, the developers who are actually designing and developing this game, they should also be uh, in interacting. Many one-person uh, one teams um, who were successful also had similar help. Uh, in the case of Eric Barone and Stardew Valley, he had Chucklefish come along beside uh, him towards the end of development and helped him support him, helped him with marketing. He said it was a huge help for him to help him kind of get to launch. Uh, and he knew that was not uh, a strength of his. Um, Alexander Bruce, who worked in Anti-Chamber, you know, he, uh, he said he had great feedback uh, from the Indie Fund folks, and they gave him marketing advice and helped sort of coach him towards launch, um, knowing that he wasn't, uh, wasn't going to be the best at, at all of the different pieces he needed for success. Henrik from Mojang said, too many developers think they can ignore the sales and marketing roles which are given in other industries. And I think that is, it, it is interesting that, uh, that he says that, but uh, I, I have seen this. I've seen uh, many games that have come and come to Steam and said, you know, oh, we didn't even think about how we were going to communicate the game uh, or how we were going to market our game for launch. We just were so focused on developing the game, we never really thought about sort of launch day or the week leading up to launch. If you're missing a role, uh, think about uh, reaching out to others. You're, he, being here at Dev Days, this is a great example of there's all of these developers around you who would love to give you uh, advice and help. There's people that are you know, brilliant at marketing and sales. There's wonderful artists in the, in the room, wonderful developers. All these people um, are more than willing to help. It surprises me, actually, in our industry how open people are and willing to, uh, even though you may see, like, oh, they're working on a game that people would you know, consider is, uh, to be uh, competing with each other, but they're actually more than willing to give advice and, uh, and help. You likely know someone, even if it's someone in your family who might be able to help with marketing or, or budgeting or design, for example. Jesse uh, talks about, he says, successful game developers have three core competencies, creative, technical, and business. Regardless of size, make sure that your team is equipped with the expertise and ability to push on all three areas with a constant sense of urgency. If even one is lacking, you'll never reach full potential. It's an important ending, full potential. How is your game going to reach full potential? What are you going to do? What are the, what are the resources you need to get your game to launch? 
and to make sure that it's fun when, when, when you're asking customers for money for it. In conclusion, I would say, you should be honest with your work, build an experience that you love, build a game that you want to play and that you want to support long term. You're not along for the ride, it's not an uncontrollable mess. I remember when I was learning to ski, uh, one of the best pieces of advice that someone told me was, don't ride the skis, drive the skis. And that was actually really valuable to help me figure out, all right, how am I gonna get these crazy sticks together and going down a big hill? You can drive your game. You get an opportunity to foster the experience, the community that you choose to create. I wanna thank, thank uh, all of the different developers who, uh, who put in their time and, and were so willing to share advice with you guys. Uh, many of them are here at Dev Days, so if you run into them, thank, you, thank them for Steam 201. Uh, they're the ones who, uh, who brought this advice to you. We're fortunate to be in this very inclusive uh, uh, gaming industry, and, uh, and, I, and I encourage you to go out and share your experiences and network with one another while you're here. I'm gonna leave you with this. Be honest with yourself and build a fun game that you want to play with a team and timeline that fits you. Thank you.